those of you who are here tonight, we want to thank you and welcome you for being with us this uh, fine Wednesday evening. For this is the week that is a great week in the uh, history of the believer. For this is the week that confirms all that we stand for in our Christian faith. To those of you who are viewing online, we want to welcome you as well. We thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedule for being with us tonight. I am not Bishop Shelby. I'm Pastor Damon. I know some people think I look like him, but deep in my heart, I know I look like this beautiful young lady that sits on the front row here this evening. That is my mother, Evangelist Prophetess Charlotte Shelby. But tonight, we're just grateful for those of you who came out to be with us. We're thanking God for what he's done this day. I was thinking about it earlier today. It just seemed like yesterday was January the 1st, and it's already April the 5th of 2023. This is a great month. It's also uh, in our family. We got birthdays coming up. Uh, First Lady's birthday will be next Thursday, and then on next Tuesday, my grandson will turn nine years old, and on that following day, that Wednesday, the 19th of April, my baby girl turns 19. And so it's just a great day uh, this month is. And then uh, my daughter and my son-in-law and my other two grandkids made it safely from Belton, Texas. They're here. Uh, they got their place. They'll be living on the base. Uh, they um, got in Monday evening, safe and sound, a nice 12-hour drive with two kids and a U-Haul. My other daughter, Biggs and Monty's mom, flew down to be with them. But we're just grateful for God's protection and safety. And as I sit here tonight, um, I'm extremely grateful and thankful for the protection of God. Many of you may know my youngest daughter attending North Carolina A&T there in Greensboro, North Carolina. And she called me last evening. And she was a little frantic, but she was okay. She was just grateful that she listened to the voice I told her it was the voice of God that spoke to her. On yesterday, they had um, one of the, over there by her football stadium on the campus, there was an apartment complex that a lot of the students go to, and there was a, a party over there. There was a gathering, a little block party, and she said she thought about just going to mingle, would see what some of the people were doing. And she said something spoke to her and said, don't go. And she said, Dad, I'm glad I listened. She said, as she had gotten the news later uh, yesterday, early evening, that there was a shooting that took place and another student got killed. And we were talking and she was saying, Dad, if you remember on our homecoming, which I think was in uh, uh, either late September, early October, they had a, a party there not too far from the campus and two students got killed. Uh, one of them was a 19-year-old second semester freshman, and the other one, I think, was just a high school student. And then she was telling me after that killing, she said that same week they were uh, at a gospel concert at the Greensboro or uh, North Carolina uh, Convention Center, a uh, Coliseum. And she said that while they were getting ready to walk out, gunshots began to ring out. She said so her and the girls she would went begin to fly out. And she was saying how um, she was just thanking God for the protection and safety. But then she dropped a major bomb on me. She said that on March, not March, but uh, yeah, March the 26th, there was a young man, 27 years of age, uh, early evening strolling through the campus. This young man had 1,000 rounds of ammunition uh, on him. He had uh, weapons. He had some shotgun, a shotgun with him, but they went and accosted him until his car, he had all kind of assault weapons in the car, and he was looking to hurt and wound and even kill uh, some of the security guards and possibly some of the students. So it was the Greensboro police and the concerted effort with the North Carolina A&T security faculty that they uh, got this guy, apprehended him. He was taken to jail but she told me he was released on bond. She said, now, Dad, they quote-unquote claim he's been barred from campus. You know, he has a restraining order from campus. But I said, you see how the protection of God is uh, upon our life. And we have a lot to be thankful for. You know, we don't think about just our daily movements from day to day. 
Many of us, we wake up in the morning and we thank God for allowing us to see another day. But sometimes we may take it for granted that when we leave our prospective homes and drive to work or going to school or wherever we may be going that particular morning, that we're going to get there safely, soundly, and return home. Sometimes we just, we're, we've been covered by the blood of God so long in our life, for those of us who've been walking in the way for a while, that sometimes you can unknowingly, unexpectedly kind of take things for granted. But every time we leave and come back home, we ought to give God praise. When we're going to the store, um, I just was in Walmart uh, the other day, and I was just walking through, and I said, Lord, I thank you. Because, you know, you've got all kind of people around here today. We don't know what an individual may have in their possessions. That's why I'm grateful and thankful that Walmart has instituted a new policy where we can't bring in backpacks and big bags and things because people were using it first and foremost to steal, but they could be concealing weapons and things. And so I, from, now, from here on out, and I made it a point for a while, I take nothing for granted. And I thank God and I bless him for the protection and safety, not only of my daughter, but other, our other college students. I think about Deacon Manley. I pray for his daughter who's there in Anchorage, Alaska, you know, way up there. And I think, you know, she could just be walking the campus and a big black bear could come out and try to wound or hurt my little list lip, you know. Or there could be some crazy folk up there, you know, Eskimos or whatever, you know, carrying assault rifles in that cold weather. But we just, sometimes we got to step back and just thank God and bless him. For those of us just here in the city of Albuquerque, just thanking God. Crime is rising, but it's not nowhere uh, near where it is in some of the other major cities here in America. Just think about it, was it last week or so, there in Nashville, Tennessee, one of the new music capitals of the world, that little school, how those kids, three babies got killed and three adults. And as I was thinking about it, you know, those parents took their children to school that particular morning, and those kids never would come home again. And how those parents would not see those kill children, you know, move on from elementary school, middle school, high school, college, and even develop... Uh, uh, careers and, and have families of their own. Their life was taken all because of one individual whose mind, and I'll say it, was possessed by the enemy to bring destruction, doom, and harm upon some innocent bystanders there. But we have a lot to be thankful for. We have a lot to be grateful for. And every time we move about, we just ought to just lift our hands and say, Lord, I thank you and I bless you for the opportunity that you've given unto us just to be able to be in the land of the living. And so before we get into the word, let's go before the Lord in prayer tonight. For we all know somebody that needs a divine touch from God. Uh, we need somebody who needs a healing in their body. And as we prowl our head tonight, let's not pray for ourselves, but let's pray for those that we know need something explicitly and expressly that only God can do. Most kind, gracious Father, as we come tonight, thanking you and blessing you for your protection and your safety that you've allowed each and every one of us to experience this day. Father, I'm thanking you, God, for how you've been better to us than we could ever be to ourselves. We're thanking you, God, for how, God, you've given us another opportunity and privilege, first and foremost, to be in the land of the living, but secondly, to be in the household of faith where we can lift our hands in praise and adoration and glory unto thee. Father, I'm thanking you right now for you sending a healing touch divinely upon your people right now. For you know the needs and the situations that we're all facing and those are loved ones and our friends, what they're dealing with right now. I'm thanking you, God, from the crown of their heads to the sole of their feet. You're divinely, sovereignly moving upon, upon their circumstances and then their situations this day. Father, those that are in the hospitals right now, I pray, God, that you would walk in their rooms and touch them right now. Dispatch your angels for those that are traveling that may be coming to service tonight. Those that may be on the road traveling home from work or going uh, different parts of the country right now. Bless them, oh God, with safe travels. Have travel mercies. Let your angels be with them. Guide and lead them this night. And Father, I pray right now, God, that you would just move upon our hearts that are here tonight. We've come to hear a word from thee. Father, let this your servant's flesh be silent so that you can speak to us to give us a word that's going to bless our life, open up our understanding, and give us illumination and revelation in the word that we're about to speak and dispense this night. Now, Father, I bless you and I thank you for those under the sound of my voice 
and even my family and friends that are viewing in different parts of the country and the world this night. We bless you and we thank you. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Tonight, we're going to be in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter number 26, since this is the Passion Week. And I want to deal with something in here that the Lord dropped in my spirit. We're going to pick up about verse number 14 through verse number 16. And I'm going to deal with a subject tonight entitled, Betrayed by a Frenemy. Betrayed by a Frenemy. And when you think about a frenemy, the thing that comes to mind is that each and every one of us, we have a frenemy within our circle of influence or our sphere of friends that are in our, our circle there. A frenemy is that individual that puts, portrays themselves to be your friend, your brother, your sister, your cohort. They portray themselves to be one that has your back, that is there for you. They grin in your face. They smile at you. They sit at your dinner table. They may even take you out to lunch, to dinner, maybe to breakfast. They present themselves as someone that uh, is concerned about you, even may put to the degree of the point that they may even put themselves in a position where they say they love you. But all the while, they are a snake, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Their frenemy is somebody that is grinning in your face publicly, but stabbing you in your back behind your face. And what's interesting is, as you really begin to think about it, each and every one of us has somebody, either currently or who has been, a frenemy in our life. And... The thing about it that it, it, it uh, dawns on me is these individuals are people that we select, that we open up, and we bring into our life, we bring into our circle, not realizing or knowing what these individuals' true intent and purpose is in our life. But one thing I want to say early on, and I may repeat it again, is that one thing about a frenemy is their role, their purpose in your life is to get you to your destiny, to that place that God has destined for your life to be. Because without a frenemy, you won't get to the next level that God has determined for your life. And I'm going to back that up by hearing the word of the Lord. Because hear what we see in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 14. It says here, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest, and said unto them, What will ye give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now, I love this because this is very powerful because we're in the Passion Week, the Holy Week as it's called. And many theologians, Theologians and scholars say that this is called Spy Wednesday. It's determined by some theologians and scholars that this is the day that Judas, as we well know, betrayed Jesus. And what I like about this whole scenario here is when you begin to read about those who read this 26th chapter, you see something very powerful here is that over in verse number 3, it talks about then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who called Caliphate. And they consulted that they might take Jesus by subtly and kill him. I like this because it lets me see something that the religious leaders of that day and time, they had it out for Jesus from the get-go. And how they got together and conspired, how they could bring him down. And I begin to really meditate upon that because we have a lot of individuals just like these religious leaders of Jesus' day who are in our life who are conspiring 
to bring us down, who are conspiring to see how they can bring detriment, to bring harm, to bring hurt, to whatever they can do to cause us pain and suffering and agony. And these individuals here, the Bible lets us know that they were crafty in how they wanted to do it, but the Bible lets us know in verse 5 that they say, no, we can't do it right now because this was a feast time. This was during the time of the Passover. And they didn't know all the people were going there, and they didn't want a, a major a saying to go on right this time at this point, so they waited a little bit. But what happens here in this chapter is very unique, is that Jesus now, the Bible lets us know here early on in this chapter, is with his disciples. The Bible lets us know there was Mary here who anoints him with the oil. And some of the disciples, the Bible said that they got indignant, they got upset, they got mad because of the fact that they thought that they were wasting that oil, that beautiful smelling perfume, that they could have used that money for something else. Now, when you read the other parts of the Gospels, it's well noted that this was Judas who was upset because he wanted that money to use for himself. He, you know, he was a treasurer and he had the ability to have the coins. And the, as you read different parts of the Gospels, he was taking some and putting it in his own pocket. But what happened here is when you read this here uh, in verses 10 through 13, you see that Jesus now, after the disciples there had showed uh, their indignation, being upset, being mad because of what this woman had done, in purifying and blessing Jesus before he uh, was to be crucified and things of that nature, that Jesus goes on to let them know, back up here, if you will, you know, she's done something great for me, and because of what she's done, she's going to be remembered for a long time. Whenever we speak about this, her name is going to be remembered. And what I like about it here is you see something about the mindset and the spirit of Judah. It's after Jesus and the other ones had spoken and how they expressed their feelings about it. And Jesus came back and reprimanded them for their behavior, their mindset, and what they had spoken. We see something here about Judas. Here we see something here when he conspires with the chief priest that before he conspired with them, he had, must have had something in his spirit to where he was already upset with Jesus from the get-go that now this event that took place kicked it up to where his anger, his frustration, and even you could say his hatred now went to another level. Now we all know that Judas' purpose was to be the one that he was sent to defy, to be the one to betray Jesus, to be the one that would put him on the cross. But he died for our sake, you and I, but it took a Judas to get him there. But what you see now here is very interesting. When I read this earlier, my mind was just blown away that it says here that Judas went unto the chief priest. They did not come to Judas, but Judas went to the chief priest, and then he tells them in verse 15, what will you give me? And I like that because it lets me see something about the frenemies in your life, that there's some that will betray you, that will cast uh, you to the, kick you to the curb, if you will. Some of them because of hatred, some of them because of envy, some of them because they're jealous. But what we see here with Judas, Judas's mindset was he betrayed him for greed purposes. It was all about greed for Judas because he wanted the money. It says in verse 15, and he said unto them, what will you give me? Now, they hadn't spoken anything unto him, but he comes unto them and say, look, I got, I'll betray him. I'll turn him over to you. But what do I get out of the cost here for doing this? What are you going to pay me? What is going to be uh, my reward, if you will, for giving up Jesus unto you? And look at here. And they said, and they covenant with him, they came into an agreement for 30 pieces of silver. And this really hit me because, first and foremost, this was the price that one would pay for a slave, was 30 pieces of silk. Now, think about Judas here. He traveled with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. 
He was there when he saw some of the miracles performed with Jesus. He was there in the intimate circle, the associate circle as I call it, because we have the masses, we have the associates, and then we have the three, which is the intimate group. But he was a part of the unique group of 12 that were handpicked and selected by Jesus to be his apostles, to be his disciples there with him. And here Judas now, all that he saw and knew Jesus to be and what he had done, because of the greed factor, he did not even really tell them, okay, when they told him 30 pieces of silver, he could have said something much, much more. But for 30 pieces of silver, he's going to be the one that betrayed his master, his Lord, his Savior. And I begin to think about that from my own life's perspective, and I know some of you probably can relate as well. We've had individuals in our circle who betrayed us for a whole lot less than what Jesus was betrayed for by Judas. Think about some of the people that you have allowed to come into your home, that you may have put up, given them a place to stay, that how you may have given some of your bill money to help these individuals out. And lo and behold, these are the same people that you went to the ends of the earth for that betrayed you, that sold you out for a small, small amount. Some people will sell you out just to see the disgust, the disdain, the tears come down your face. And these are the very people that have patted you on your back. Think about the kiss of betrayal that many of us have gone through. But one thing about it is, is that kiss of betrayal that you have received from your Judas is that was the kiss that has catapulted you to your next level of destiny. Because in order for you to get to where God has ordained you to go, there has to be a Judas that appears in your life that is the catalyst to get you to your next level. Because some of those Judas is what they cause us to do. They cause us now to seek after Christ on a whole nother level, on a whole nother realm than we would have. The people that betrayed us the most now cause us to ask God why. Lord, why? We pray a little bit more. We fast a little bit more because we want God to reveal the answers to why I had to suffer this. But when you look at the life of Jesus, you understand that Judas's purpose in his life was to push him and catapult him to the cross of Christ so that you and I can have salvation. That was Judas's purpose. And the Judas in your life, their purpose was to come to betray you to get you to where God had determined for your life. But think about it here. How can you sit with the master and do what he done? Think about the mind that Judas had to have with the heart combined with it. That he's sitting there with Jesus and he's plotting and scheming about how he's going to betray him. He's thinking about it. That how for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave is what our Lord and Savior was sold out for. He did not even say, look, that's not worth it. But the greed factor, he just wanted something. And I thought about it here. Jesus knew what was going on, but yet he had to go with the plan that the Father had orchestrated before the foundation of the world for his life. When you read through this chapter here, what gets me is how, in verse number 21, when he's now sitting down with the twelve, and it says here, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. The Bible lets us know, go on, that he goes down in verse number 23 and said, And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. Verse number 24 says, The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him. But woe unto him, to that man, by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Verse number 25 lets us see that Judas now asked the question, Master, is it I? And what was Judas' words? It says here, Thou hast said, which is interpreted, yes. Now, he has the audacity here to ask Jesus if it's me. 
when he knew within his heart and his mind that it was him. But you see how the enemy works. That we can do the wrong things. We can say the wrong words. And we can be believing in our heart and our mind and our spirit that our actions, that is not us. Judas here asked the question and he received the answer. But think about the role that he took to get to this point. The plotting, the scheming that he had to do. Think about how he said there that you give me the pieces of silver and I will betray him, verse 16 said, in due time and due season. The scheming aspect of how he set this thing up. He had to wait. And I thought about it. How the individuals that betray us, it's a premeditated situation that they are in at that time and moment. How they calculate exactly when they're going to fully allow that plan that they've established to come into place. How they scheme and how uh, they manipulate and how they get close enough to each and every one of us. They're in our circle there and they will, will us in by befriending us. But they're a friend of me and, and not a real friend. They're that enemy that portrays to be your friend, that portrays to be your brother, that portrays to be your sister. But all the while, they are a plot from the pit of hell to bring you down, to cause you doom, gloom, and destruction, to cause you to get your eyes off Christ. And there's many a people that allow the Judas in their life because they did not understand the motive and the, and the role that they were playing in their life to get them off track. And some of them have left the household of faith. But those of you here tonight, that Judas has been planted in your life. Their role is to get you to your next level of destiny that God has for your life. Without Judas appearing on the scene, Jesus would not have made it to Calvary. But that was Judas's role. His primary purpose was to come into this world Come into this world to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Can you imagine having that upon you? Judas knew his role, his purpose, what he had to do. And he fulfilled it to the T. And then when it was done, what happened? He kills himself because of the weight, the pressure of knowing that I was the one that betrayed my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Judas is in my life when they recognize and realize just what they've done to us. They may not die a literal, figuratively, a literal death, but figuratively there's something that transpires in their life that they're not the same. Because when they see you, when they look at you, they got to recognize and realize I caused them what I thought was pain, but all I did was push them to what God had determined for their life. Judas here betrayed our Lord and Savior, a frenemy who presented himself. All those that were there with Jesus, how they asked him, is it I? Is it I? But it was Judas that said, Master, is it I? Knowing deep in his heart and his spirit what he had already conspired to do with the chief priests and the religious leaders of that day and how he was instrumental in pushing Jesus to the destiny that was before him. Judas, sitting there, dining with him, listening to him. But he was the frenemy in the face of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Every one of us has a frenemy. Some of us have more than one that have conspired to bring us down. But when you begin to think about what they're doing in your life, it should get you and motivate you to celebrate God for them and not bring about doom and gloom in their life, but bless God for them because they're the catalyst that is pushing you to the destiny that he has before you. And see, it's hard if you're not in the right mindset when you know and see individuals that are plotting and scheming against you to bring you down. They're talking about you. And you know you spent your hard-earned money on them. You spent good quality time with them. You've labored with them in their circumstance, in their situation, not fully recognizing nor realizing that they were killing you at the same time as they were trying to love on you. 
that they were stabbing you in your back while they were hugging you at the same time. The same people that spoke highly of you were speaking negatively behind your back. The people that you thought was your brothers, your sisters, that you thought you had a bond, a relationship with, they're nothing more than that frenemy that's presenting themselves to be one thing, but they're totally the opposite of what they presented themselves to be. But God has orchestrated them to be in your life to get you to the level of destiny and ministry that he has in your life. How many of you all have some frenemies in your life that you know have been there, that you may have some right now? Open your eyes and see. It's a hard thing when, you, when that frenemy is presented to you. After you hear or recognize that these individuals, speaking from my own situation, how I've befriended some people over the years and how the people that I thought were my friends and how they stabbed me in the back. How they, it crushed my heart so. Therefore, I was devastated. I was down for a little while. But then God spoke to my spirit and said, look at what they did for you that how it blessed you to get you to where you are today. Had they not appeared in your life, you would not be on the road that you are right now going to where I have for you to go. And that's when he brought this to my spirit. Everybody has a Judas in their life that we need to celebrate. Because many times when we see that Judas come, we want to curse them. We want to uh, speak harm and doom and gloom upon them. But when we see the Judas arise, we got to celebrate because that's the key instrument to get us to the next level of kingdom ministry that God has for us. And we see here, Judas, when Jesus spoke to him, he calmly just said, thou hast said. Can you imagine the mind of Judas when he heard the word that Jesus spoke, which was interpreted, which meant yes. That what he thought was in the dark was now manifested in the light before him. And then you see the uniqueness of it that the other disciples that were there had no clue or knowledge of what was really going on because of the conversation that had transpired with Jesus and Judas. They did not understand what had taken place. And that's what happens in our life. Until we speak about it, people don't understand or realize the role that that Judas played in your life until you speak about it. You don't have to tell the people their name. Sometimes people know and they ask, what happened to that relationship with thus and so, such and such? And then when you begin to speak and you begin to say what transpired and you, we do it in a way that we try to cover our brother and our sister that's wounded us, that hurts us, that's tried to bring doom and gloom to our life, that sometime through our taking the high road, God reveals some things unto them and they see and understand what has happened. It's a hard thing when that Judas betrays you. And I thought about it here, how Jesus was with this man way before he betrayed him. But he knew in the beginning the purpose that Judas had. But yet, he loved him. He didn't do any ill to him. Knowing, and I said, Lord, that is an example to us as believers. That when we see the Judas in our life come to the forefront, we still got to love them. We got to treat them as you treated Judas in your life. How you were there. And you still treated him with the same respect. Even before he betrayed you and after he betrayed you. But Judas' actions took care of himself. Betrayed by a friend of me. It's a hard thing when you begin to really think about it. Every one of us has had somebody do this unto us. And at that time and moment when it took place, you didn't have the full understanding or knowledge of why. We cried out, why, Lord? Why, Lord, did this have to happen? Lord, these are the ones that I put time and energy and effort. These are the individuals. This is the person, Lord that I've sold money into their life. I put myself on the back burner for these individuals. And this is what I get out of it. But when you step back, even now as we're speaking and talking, and you realize 
that if they hadn't showed up, you would not be where you are at this time and moment. Some of you are on your road to destiny. Some of you have walked in it. But many of us, we're still ascending into it. But it's all because the Judas in our life that betrayed us, that was that frenemy, pushed us, catapulted us, was the catalyst. They were the tool to get us to where we are right now. And when you begin to think about it, that Judas that shows up in your life causes you now to seek after God more intently than ever before. Because when you get hurt, you call out to God like never before. And Judas here, during this Passion Week, he revealed his true character, his true purpose and intention of being the one that was designated to betray our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he was the tool, the catalyst that God used to get him to Calvary's cross. It was Judas that had the task, the inevitable task, that his sole purpose for living was to betray our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That was his purpose. That was his mission that God had ordained for his life. And he fulfilled it. And then because of what he did, the weight, the pressure upon him, the Bible lets us know that he kills himself. Because when he recognized and realized what he had done, he couldn't handle the weight, the pressure, the severity of his action. And so he thought it better to take his own life. The Judas is in our life. They may not have taken their life, but every time they see you, hear your name, maybe see a picture of you, may hear of you, they have to relive the moment that they betrayed you. They have to think about all that they did unto you, and they have an eternal whipping that they're taking right here in the here and now because they were used by God to be a blessing to us. So those of you who know your frenemies, those of you who may not know they're on their way, but you start celebrating God for them right now because those are the individuals or the individual that is pushing you to the divine purpose that God has for your life. Because without the Judas arising in your life, you will not get to the destiny that God has ordained for your life. Most kind, gracious Father, we shared what you've given unto us this day. I'm thanking you, God, for the Judases that have arisen in the lives of my brothers, my sisters, my friends, my family members this day. Those that are on the way, God, I pray that you will bless them as the believer to allow the Judases to take place. When they see the Judas in their life, allow them, oh God, to celebrate you. Lord, we're celebrating in advance. We're thanking you for those of us whose Judas has arisen. We're thanking you, God, for them pushing us and catapulting us to where you have us to go. And we even thank you for the other Judas that may arise. They may be the other instruments that get us even greater to where we have to go. But Father, I thank you right now, God, for how Judas played a role in your life to get you to where? The cross of Christ, oh God, that now you thought about all of us, oh God, that you died on that cross, oh God. This is the Holy Week, and we're blessing you for God how it's doing this week, oh God, that all that we stand for, all that we believe, God, we're thanking you and blessing you that it was confirmed, oh God, and that now we have what we believe, oh God, has been solidified and verified. And Father, I thank you for those that are here tonight that you will bless them, oh God, as they walk in their walk with thee, as they go deeper and higher in the things that you've called them unto. I pray, God, for the angels of grace and mercy to surround them, oh God, and be with them. And I pray, God, as we're moving into the kingdom destiny, that, God, that you would bless us all to fulfill the purpose, the plan, and the will that you have designated and designed for our life before the foundations of the world. Father, we thank you, we bless you, and we magnify you this day for being betrayed by Judas. We love you and we celebrate you. Amen and amen. Truly, we thank God for the word that he's given unto us tonight. I pray that something's been said that will help you 
as you're on your walk with Christ to recognize and realize that everybody in your life is not there for your life, but there's there are some individuals that are set there by God to be that frenemy to get you to where he has designated for you to go in your kingdom purpose in the kingdom. Tonight, before we close out, we want to give everybody an opportunity to sow tonight as God has placed upon your heart and in your spirit to my online family. If you would just go on our website there, we have a section, our giving session, where we have three distinct levels of giving that you can sow into the kingdom. You can sow through our PayPal, our Cash App, which is dollar sign God's House Church, and also our Givelify. And for those of you who may not like to give electronically, please write to us at God's House Church, 2335 Wyoming Boulevard Northeast, here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Our zip is 87112. And also those of you who may send in your giving tonight uh, through our mail, I want you to do something very special as well. I want you to drop in a little small note there and let us know how the ministry not only on Wednesdays, but on Sundays as well, is being a blessing unto your life. We're getting testimonies about how God is moving in the lives of the people of God and how the word of the Lord is ministering to them and taking them to higher heights and deeper depths. And that is such a blessing to hear that what we do as we minister God's word, because sometimes being the vessel, sometimes when we finish, we don't maybe feel or think that we've accomplished the task that's before us, and so is your comment. And your words that you speak unto us lift our spirit to let us know that we're doing what God has spoken to us and it's being effective and efficient in the lives of the believers. So we are thanking you for not only sowing a tangible gift, but sow us a, a, a word of inspiration and encouragement for us to continue on. And so we're thanking you for every seed that you're sowing tonight. And also for those of you here, there's an offering uh, envelope in the seat pocket in front of you. You can sow electronically or you can sow with your cash, your check, your money order, however God has placed upon your heart. We want you to sow liberally and sow largely. Also, for those of you uh, who are going to be with us this coming Sunday, those of you viewing online and those of you with us, this is the Sunday that our bishop, our apostle here, has asked that every member above our tithes and offering, we're going to sow an Easter offering of a $100 seed that God would do some great things here in the midst of God's house church. Some have already sown, and we're thanking God for you uh, the giving that you've given, and those of you that are giving, every time you sow, put a name on your seed to watch God move as you've asked him to move. And so we want to thank you for being with us tonight. But before we go, I want to invite you, those of you in the local viewing area tonight, to be with us this coming Sunday as we're having resurrection service here at God's House Church at 10 a.m. We're going to have a powerful Christian education a move by our children in their Easter production and play. And then at 11 a.m., we're going to have a spirit-filled move of God. Resurrection Sunday is going to be in the house. We're going to, the apostle is going to preach a word that's going to energize you, that's going to charge you, because we're going to hear God speak to let us know that he is risen, he is alive, and we're going to celebrate and magnify God. And then on this coming Tuesday at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary, we're praying, we're crying out to God. So we want to invite you to come out and be with us. And then at 11.30 on Tuesday a.m. on one of our social media platforms, Pastor Bester Smith is speaking and ministering a word that will bless your life, that will cause you to dig deeper in the word of God and challenge you to seek after him like never before. And then we return back on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. The saints of God are gathered in the sanctuary where we're crying out, for God to move in our midst, to heal our lands, to touch the nation and the world, and to save dying man and bring all that don't know him unto the knowledge of repentance unto him. And then at 7 p.m., we're here in the sanctuary, and the word of the Lord is going forth. Our apostle will be teaching this coming Wednesday at 7 p.m., so I want everybody to be with us. But we want to thank everybody's viewing online, and those of you who are here, your beautiful faces, we're thanking God for you, but we're expecting to see you this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. and for a powerful move at 11 a.m. Because we want to thank God for allowing us to be here in this place. For this is the place where everybody is somebody, and Jesus Christ is Lord of us all, but most importantly, he loves us all. Amen. Deacon 
Uh, Carter is back in the back with the basket back there. Take your seed back there. We're praying God's safety and protection.